When I was at one of the churches in Scottsdale, a couple times we did uh, an overview of the Bible during the service, and uh, it was very interesting. We started in Genesis, worked all the way through the life of Christ, and, and again, just gave this, and it had some dramatic elements. It had people up as, you know, some of the Bible characters. It had songs worked in and, and passages, and, and uh, both times I was tasked to play the part of Jesus. And uh, I would wear my hair down and, uh, you know, when it came to his ministry, do some things. And, and both times I had people come up to me afterward and I remember they would say, you look just like him. And I couldn't help but smile I'm like, well, that depends on which Jesus you're, you know, where you get your image of Jesus. And uh, of course, the common image that we have of Jesus, and they're going to bring it up here in a second, uh, you realize it comes from, you know, the Renaissance period, basically, some of the paintings, and it's a, a European white man, and that wasn't Jesus. You know, it doesn't look anything like that. And they'll, again, when they have a chance, they'll put it up there. But uh, recently, someone came up with a picture of Jesus, and it actually looks nothing like what we imagine. They, they based it on what would a Jew living at that time period, uh, what would he probably look like? And when you put that one up, it, again, it's just nothing like we imagine. And so uh, let me know when that's up so I don't have to keep looking over there and we'll stop. Um, but as we focus on things today, you know, more important than where we get our physical picture of Jesus from some painting or whatever is the idea of where do we get our ideas about Jesus? So there it is. There's, you know, the common image of Jesus. And uh, like I say, if I put my hair down, I don't know, maybe I've got a little bit of that going on. I've had that before. And yeah, I got the beard and such. But here's the image that uh, someone has come up with for, again, what someone in that day and age looked like. And, you know, take a look at that. I mean, he could be sitting next to you at lunch. You wouldn't even know that guy. But that's what a Jewish male at that time would look like. So, you know, good thing when he comes back, you know, there'll be trumpets and he'll be the guy in the clouds. So we'll recognize him there because <laughs> we wouldn't otherwise. But as I say, even more important than, okay, what physical uh, picture do I see in my mind when I think of Jesus is where do I get my ideas? You know, what, what's my image, my thought of Jesus? And as we've said in the first couple weeks of looking at Colossians, I doubt there's anyone here, and maybe hardly anyone at all, who is entirely wrong about Jesus, who just has nothing, you know, no idea at all who he was, what he was like. But are we entirely right about Jesus? You know, would I say that? I'm totally right in my idea about Jesus. Well, Christ is the center of the Christian life, so you look on your handout, the main idea today that everything's going to revolve around is that I can only live out the Christian life to the degree I know Christ. Again, not know what he looks like, but know who he is and know what he has done. And that's what the passage today is going to focus on. You know, in the book of Colossians so far, we've seen that you know, Paul starts off this letter to the church in Colossae, and he says, I am thankful to God for you, because of the hope that you have laid up in heaven. Verse 5 of chapter 1. And if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in chapter 1, uh, verse 15 in a minute. He says, I'm thankful to God that you have this hope, that you are sure of going to heaven based on the fact that you have been forgiven. And both of those things are complete. They're done. You have been forgiven. And because of that, you have this hope of going to heaven when you die, when Christ returns. Now, you remember we said salvation has three aspects. It has the idea of when I first become a Christian, I'm forgiven. Because of that, I will go to heaven. But in between, the day I become a Christian until I die, the, the, pro, the part of salvation that we need to focus on is the, the transformation, the spiritual growth. You know, the big Bible words for that, and they are in the Bible, so we should be familiar with them. Forgiveness is justification. And being transformed is sanctification, and eventually our, our new eternal bodies living that way in heaven is glorification. Well, Paul has said, you have been forgiven, you are going to heaven, I'm thankful for that. But then he prays that sanctification, that transformation would happen. And that's where he says in verse 9, if you want to look at chapter 1, 
It says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And that was our focus last week, this idea of walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And we said the first thing to realize, it absolutely is not worthy of earning salvation worthy of being saved, worthy of God liking me more or loving me more. My works don't contribute to that, my good deeds, my bad deeds. It is not that. It's worthy of having been saved and the nature of having been saved and by whom I was saved. And we said the focus there, it's not on good or bad. It's not on the good things I do and the bad things I do. Remember last week we said those are like the basics. That's the baseline. (laughs) The good and bad Of course, I'm supposed to do good, not bad. The focus of walking worthy is this idea of walking by faith, not by sight. Of in everything that God does, everything that I do, I live a life based on the fact I trust there's a God, that he's in control, and that he loves me. And that directs my decisions and my steps, my goals, my priorities, everything. And then we also said the key is walking worthy of the Lord. You know, So I need to know, who is this Lord? And it ties in. What Paul's saying here follows up on that. I want you to know about Christ because he's the one. He's the one you're to be walking worthy of, specifically the Son. And it says in verse 13, we finished with this last week. He says, For God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul is basically following up on that today. The the key to knowing Christ is, is walking worthy. And so Paul goes into detail about Jesus. Here's who he is. Here's what he's done. And you also remember, just one last thing to to get us into the context here. Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians, not just because he wanted to say, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm thankful. I want this to happen. He was doing that anyway. But he had heard some report that there was some false teaching that had started in Colossae. And we don't know exactly what it was, But any false teaching, remember I said any false teaching emphasizes works versus grace. Well, also any false teaching diminishes Christ. Whatever you can think of, it diminishes him. He's, well, maybe he was a good guy. Maybe he was a prophet. Maybe he did some things, but you need more. All of it diminishes him in one way or the other. So once again, Paul needs to let these people know, here's who Christ truly is. And you need to know him to walk worthy of the Lord. And so that's what we see. That sets us up here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. And let's go ahead and read 15 through 20. He is the image, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning, and I'll explain why I've switched for this passage later on. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or in heaven, making, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Paul starts this off as he begins to, to really explain Jesus and to tell them about him in detail. He says that he is the image of the invisible God. And we know that God is spirit, God is invisible by nature, but because of the incarnation, because of God becoming man, and specifically God, we know God is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the Son came to earth. He was born as a baby. We celebrate at Christmas. He grew up and he lived this life. And because of that, he he puts a face on God, so to speak. And fortunately, the, the emphasis isn't on physical because we have the wrong face of Jesus physically but it's on him spiritually. Here's what God is like. We see him all through the Old Testament, but even more so, here's this image of God. Here's who he is. Here's what he's like. And it says, this Christ then is the firstborn of all creation. And sometimes that throws us, this idea of firstborn. And one commentator said about the only thing firstborn doesn't mean is born first. Uh, It's the idea here when it applies to Christ, it can mean first in time, But it also can mean first in rank. 
And that's what Paul is talking about here. In the ancient world, and, and even it continues today, uh, the firstborn son had a special place in the family. And, you know, if any of you are firstborn, you might be thinking, oh, well-deserved. Or if you're not, you're like, oh, yeah, tell me about it. Uh, but like I say, it continues. You know, that's why Prince William will one day be King William and Prince Harry will always be Prince Harry. But uh, in the ancient world, that idea was very strong. In fact, in ancient Israel, the firstborn son would get a double portion of the inheritance. And when it came to the line of Christ, that blessing, they received that. And so what this is, is talking about Jesus has that role of firstborn. You know, that role that's, that's above others. It's not that he literally was born and there's other sons of God or anything. It's just like he has that rank. And it even says in Psalm 87, God appointed him that. You know, he gave that rank to him. 4, verse 16, for by him all things were created. Here's sort of the reason. Here's how he deserves it. Here's here we know he has this rank. For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, when he talks about these all things and he goes into thrones and dominions and rulers, it's not like there's set definitions for those. It's not like, well, a throne is this versus a dominion, it's this. What well, it seems like Paul is addressing this false teaching, and they had these ideas. And Paul had heard, you know, okay, they talk about thrones or this or that. And so Paul's saying, listen, whatever you've got in mind, whether you think there's a throne and a dominion, and, and they rival Christ in any way, well, they can't. Because all things, visible, invisible, throne, dominion, whatever, they were all created by Christ. How can anything be superior to the creator of those things? And that's the point that he's making here. You know, all things were created by Jesus. He's above them. He has the superior rank to them. And when it says, he does three words here, created by him, through him, and for him. And that by him, all translations use it, but more literally it should be in him. You know, the by him idea comes in with the, the through. You know, he's the one who did it. But in him has a, another sense of this fuller meaning. And it's a little bit like we talk about, and Paul does it over and over. Remember when he talks about in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in him? It's like this sphere of Christ. As Christians, we're, we're in that sphere. Everything we do is to be, you know, just characterized by that. It, it summarizes all of it. Well, as he's talking about this, everything was created in Christ. Yeah, in this sphere, it, it has to do with him. And it's not like things were created and we're all a little bit of Jesus. It's not saying that at all. It's just saying there's nothing outside of the sphere of Christ. Well, if it's in his sphere, again, he's superior to it. He's above it. And they were created through him. He was the mediator of creation. From what we can tell, God was sort of the architect and Jesus did that. And the Holy Spirit, it tells us, was hovering on the face of the earth as it went on. And then it tells us also that everything was created for Christ. And that's the idea that the purpose, the goal of everything is to bring glory to Christ. It's to bring glory to God, but again, Christ is the, the focal point of that. And it tells us that. It's the, he's the image. He's the one, the focus of that glory. Everything. The purpose of creation. And, and that means every person every empire, every event throughout history, without God overriding people's free will, everything has been moving to this point of willingly or unwillingly giving glory to him. Sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly in the sense of, you know, even when a person disobeys God, we see it goes wrong and they're like, okay, you see Christ's glory there. And if it doesn't happen here, it will definitely be revealed in heaven. God's glory, Christ's glory, Will, will be seen as the reason for everything. And then verse 17 says, He is before all things. You know, he, he was there before them. Why? Well, because He created them. And in Him all things hold together. And this is the idea, and maybe you've heard of, have you ever heard of the, the term deism? Deism is this view that says, and a lot of our founding fathers had this, founding fathers of the country. Deism says God created the world, and ever since, he's been sitting back and watching. It's called the watchmaker theology. He, he makes the watch, he winds it up, and then you don't have to do anything. It just runs on its own, right? And I say, a lot of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, 
uh, has a Bible called the Jefferson Bible. He went through the New Testament Gospels and took out all the miracles. And so it doesn't even, it ends with Jesus being put in the tomb. He doesn't resurrect because that's a miracle, and Jefferson didn't believe in that. God hasn't interacted in the world. Paul is denying that. He's saying all things hold together in Christ. It's not just like God created the world, and it's been okay since. It's just very, you know, the very essence. You know, the molecules wouldn't even be together if Christ still wasn't holding them together. You know, one commentator said, because of Christ, the universe is a cosmos, not a chaos. And so physically, he's holding it together, but also he's in control. It's that idea again. You know, think of, and especially now in our world, you know, think of how with nuclear weapons, the world just could have ended. Well, God's in control. It's not going to end until God says it's going to end. That's why I never worried about things, you know, when I was younger with the nuclear, like, well, hope it doesn't happen, but it's not going to happen unless God says it's going to happen. So if it happens, he wanted it to happen. In that sense, now, that doesn't mean everything, people don't make choices, but the end of the world is not going to happen until God says. God is in control. All things hold together. And I, you know, and I see you shaking your head, and we all agree. I think any of us, you can take the test. You know, am I a deist? No. But do I live like it sometimes? I say God's in control. But boy, how often do I live like, oh, it all depends on me. <laughs> I'm in control. I, I, you know, oh. I don't see any way, I, I just don't understand it, so it can't be. We, we live like Deus. We're not. We wouldn't take the Bible and cut it up like Jefferson, but we pretty much live that way. And so we need to realize, and that's what Paul's telling them, all things hold together in Christ. And so you see, he talks about Christ in creation. He says, walk worthy of the Lord. Walk worthy of Christ. Who is he? He is God himself. He created everything. He's the goal of all creation. He's the sustainer of this original creation. And then Paul switches from the original creation to the new creation. Verse 18, he says he's also the head of the body, the church. And the New Testament talks about how the church is God's new creation because we are new creations as Christians and we are the church. It's not a building. It's all of the believers, all of the new creations, and so it is the new creation. Well, guess what? <laughs> the creator of the old creation, Christ, he's the head of the new creation, the head of the body, the church. And that word church, you probably heard it means called out. But it's not just to be called out, it's to answer the call. In ancient Greece, a herald would go through the city at different times when there needed to be a meeting of the citizens. People who were actually citizens were eligible to attend this meeting, and he'd, he'd call out to those people. And whoever heeded the call, whoever answered and showed up to the meeting, they were the church. The ecclesia is the Greek word. Well, the church today are people who have not just heard the call, not just been called, have heeded the call, have accepted the the call, have made the commitment to become Christians. Well, Christ is the head of the body, the church. And that head, is, it's parallel to firstborn. It's the idea of rank. You know, in a body, it's, various parts are more important, but the head is the head. You know, that's the most important. Well, that's who Christ is. He has that rank. And again, the head of the body, it's parallel to in him. There's this just intimate relationship as Christians were in him. As members of the body, we are in his body. There's that intimate relationship that we have with Christ. You know, he is the creator, and even then, he's been with us, and he certainly came to be with us. But here you see this relationship as Christians. I'm a member of Christ's body. He's the head. I'm a member. And there's that intimate connection and relationship. He is the beginning, it goes on to say, the firstborn from the dead. And the, the Greek, you know, sometimes if we want to emphasize things, if I were to read that and emphasize he, I'd say he is the beginning. And you get the point. Okay, he. Well, Greek's able to do it in the language itself. And that's what you see when you, when you look there. You'll see it's saying he, he alone and no one else is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And here it is, firstborn does have the idea of first in time. He's the beginning. He's the first. He's the founder of the church. He's the first Christian, if you want to say, and we all have come after him. He is the first, also, the firstborn from the dead. He's the first to rise from the dead. He's the first one. It's going to happen to us if we're believers, but he was the first one it happened to. 
And one thing to keep in mind too, whenever you see in the New Testament, and this comes through very clearly in Romans 6, where it talks about Christ didn't just die for sin, he died to sin. And so we're not only going to rise physically as he did, we're to rise spiritually. And it talks about he's the firstborn from the dead. Yes, one day after I die, I will rise physically. But right now, I'm to follow in his death to sin. I say no to sin, and I live the rest of my life living to God. Well, he's the first one that did that in a different way because he never sinned. But once he died, that was his final no. You remember in the garden, he's father, if there's any other way, <laughs> but I'll do your will. That was his final no to sin. And he rises and he was never tempted again. Well, as Christians, we make that decision. Say, God, I'm saying no to sin and I'm saying yes to living for you. He was the first one. We follow in his steps for that as well. We'll see that also later in Colossians. That in everything, he might be preeminent. And again, the he there is emphasized. It's he himself might be preeminent. He might have first place, it says in one translation. He might have the supremacy in another. Well, this is one of those things that's interesting because think about it. Christ already is preeminent, isn't he? He's God. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. You can't get much more preeminent than that. Well, what Paul is saying here, you notice he says that he might be. It's not that he isn't, it's that he might be recognized by you as being. And not, again, I love this analogy, not just the answer on the test, who's preeminent? Christ, I got that one right. But that I would live like Christ has first place. Like he's preeminent. Like he has the supremacy in the universe and in my life. Christ is preeminent preeminent because he's the beginning of the church. You know, and think about it. Paul is addressing these, these false teachers in the church. Well, how can you be teaching against what the head of the church said? He's the one who founded it. He gets to say what's what. You can't come along later and say, no, the church should be doing this. No, Christ said this, and he's the head. And he's also because he's the firstborn from the dead. It says in Romans 1, 4, and it's on your handout, it says, Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now, was Jesus the Son of God before he rose from the dead? Yeah. But the resurrection showed it. It declared it. It's like, listen, he said he's the Son of God. He's done various miracles. But the resurrection puts an exclamation point on it. He is the Son of God. He did die for sins. He is the only way to eternal life. Got it? God declared that with the resurrection and we need to then live that way we need that he might be have that preeminent status verse 19 for in him all the fullness of god was pleased to dwell and this is why i went with the english standard version today because literally that phrase says because in him it did please all the fullness to dwell and the subject of the verb was pleased is uncertain and the new american standard which i've used the first couple weeks it like fills in the gap and i don't they didn't do it right according to me. Colossians, and I put down what the New American Standard, Colossians 1.19 says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Well, you'll notice, and if you have the New American Standard or read it, the way it does things is sometimes, and languages do this, sometimes a word's implied, and so the New American Standard will put it in italics to let you know it's not literally in the text, but it doesn't make sense without it. And usually, it, it doesn't affect the meaning at all. Well, here, for some reason, I don't know if someone slipped in when no one was looking, but they went ahead and interpreted it. And that's just, that's not the nature of that translation. It's usually very word for word and literal. And they let you know. Well, they let you know fathers wasn't in there, but they picked. It could have been fathers, could have been God, could have been Christ. And they chose specifically father, and I think that's wrong. I think it's talking about God in general, all the fullness of deity, which includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the reason, you know, it's like, why is Steve going on about this little thing? No, the point is, it wasn't just the Father's good pleasure for Jesus to come and dwell. It was Jesus' good pleasure. It wasn't like the Father said, hey, son, get out there and go do this. Oh, man, I, you know, we've seen this with sons that, oh, I don't really want to. No, Jesus said, yes, I want to go there and dwell on earth, despite what that meant. And Philippians tells us, gives us some insight on the handout, Philippians 2. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, in other words, he was God himself, 
did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held on to, to say, I'm not giving up this position I have in heaven here at all and everything that goes with it, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. See, Christ delighted in that. It pleased him to dwell on earth. And why did it please him to do that? Not just for doing that itself. It's not like just, hey, this will be like a vacation, you know? We go down to Florida. Christ says, hey, I'll go down to earth for a while. No, it's because of the reason he did it. Why was Christ pleased to dwell, verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross? He came to earth not just to live the life and give us teachings. That's fine, but we didn't need a teacher primarily. We needed a savior. And that's what he did. And Philippians follows up that same thought. The next verse in Philippians says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which was the most physically agonizing, but also for a Jew, just absolutely humiliating to die on a cross. And so why was Christ pleased to dwell? Well, because he needed to do that to reconcile us, to make peace between us and God, which means prior to that there wasn't peace. And how did he do it? Through his blood on the cross. And we're going to focus on that next week. The verses next week go into detail about what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be lost? We talk about that all the time. Saved, lost, what's it mean? It's one of those things that, well, I know what it means, so you ask me. And I know some idea of what it means, but we're going to look in detail. And so Paul, as he often does, he introduces the idea, then it, you know, it's like God prompts him, like, hey, we need to go into detail about that. And so he does in the next verses. But he says there, he reconciled all things, all of creation, not just us, but Romans 8 says everything in creation was, was screwed up by sin. Christ is going to make it all back to the way God intended things to be. He was pleased to leave heaven and dwell on earth. Why? Because he knew that's what it's going to take to restore this relationship between God and man. The reason God created us in the first place, and even though we're the ones that broke the relationship and continue to, God says, I want it back. I want to have that relationship with you now and for eternity. So you look at this. Let's take it all now. We've seen the verses. We looked in depth at them. Paul tells us who Jesus is and what he's done. He's created all that is. He's founded the church. Basically, what Paul tells us without using the word is he tells us about Christ's glory. You know, that's another one of those Christian words that I know what it means, but. And usually, you know, to try to depict glory, again, on the pictures, you'll see like a, an aura around Christ. And maybe the apostles have it, too. And no one else does. Just Christ and maybe him or maybe the apostles. But in the regular people, we don't have glory because, you know, we're just regular. Well, in the ancient world, everyone had glory. Glory was almost like your reputation. It's who you were and what you had done. So everyone had glory. Some people had good glory. Some people had bad glory. But everyone had glory. Well, so Paul is telling us about Christ's glory. Here's who he is. Here's what he's done. And why does he do that? Why does he give such a thorough explanation of Jesus' glory? Well, the answer is in the middle of this passage. Paul builds up to it. And then he builds on it, and it's that phrase right in the middle that says that in everything, he, Christ, might be preeminent. That he would have the supremacy, that he would have first place. And again, he's al he already is, but he would be recognized as such, that he would be recognized as the Lord. So going back to last week, because remember, this is all one thought for Paul. You guys just won't sit here for an hour and a half and let me do it all in one session, will you? Mm -hmm. He says, so that you can walk worthy of the Lord. Well, you need to know who the Lord is. Here's who he is so that he can be preeminent. Well, you need to know he is. Here's why you should recognize him as such. And you can only do that to the degree that you realize what it means that he is Lord. So you realize his glory. So once again, Paul has said this Jesus who these false teachers are coming in and, and undermining and diminishing. Let me tell you who this Jesus is. He's God. The God who created everything. He was him walking here among us, among some people they may know. This Jesus, he created all things. There was nothing 
And he created everything. And it was created for him. You see something and you say, what's that for? Well, if I'm the creator, it's for whatever I want it to be because I created it. It was created for him. And it's still held together by him. The, the, the cosmos would spin off in chaos if he wasn't holding it together. The world, things wouldn't be at this point. You, know, you think of the history that they were aware of with the Greeks and the Romans and people before that, Jewish history, the Babylonians and the Persians, and he's in control of all that. And he's still in control, this Christ. He's also the creator, the beginning of the church. This church that we're in, this church that people are threatening, he's the one that started it. And he was the first to rise from the dead. We'll follow because of him, both physically and in this life we need to follow spiritually. That in everything he may be preeminent. Why? Because he was pleased to empty himself. Think about that for a minute. Emptying himself. Have you ever had to, you know, maybe something happened in your house. I had some friends that needed some remodeling done, so they had to move out. And you don't usually move out into a nicer place. You go to a hotel room or you stay with a friend or, you know, we ended up in Arizona losing our house and we stayed in a condo for a while. You know, you don't look forward to those things, do you? You don't look forward to the power going out and having to, you know, whatever, stay in a tent or something. It wasn't like Christ said, hey, this will be like a vacation. No, in ways we don't even understand, he had to empty himself. He was still God, but he's God now here. And on the best day here, you know, you've heard those phrases, good day fishing is better than a bad day anywhere else. You know, a bad day in heaven, if there was such a thing, is better than the best day on earth. And he gave it up, he emptied himself. Why? Because that's what it takes took to reconcile us, and boy, what was he willing to do there? To die on the cross, to have this, we can't even comprehend, some kind of separation from God for a while because of sin. And just think of the contrast. This passage starts out, he is God, he's the creator, and it ends up with him on the cross. That's this Christ. As we think about the role he should have in our life, don't just think about, okay, there's Jesus. That's who Jesus is. And everything we do needs to be shaped by that because I can only live out the Christian life to the degree I know about Christ. And the problem goes back to, just like the image, we think we know what Christ looks like. Anyone that would see that image, oh, that's Jesus. <laughs> no, it's not. We know that image very well, don't we? Matter of fact, it's not just we recognize it. If you, if you had some, one of those you know, sketch artists who had never heard of Jesus, you could describe it, and I'll bet it would turn out, and people would say, hey, that's Jesus. We know that image very well. We know the wrong image very well. well maybe that's true of the image of Jesus. And again, not totally wrong, but not totally right. And I know it so well, there's almost a degree to which I know Jesus too much and not well enough. I know him so much, I think I know him, and that keeps me from realizing, wow, there's some things I don't know about him. There's some things that don't play into my mind as I think about living for Jesus, and I miss it. What are some of the ways that in life we have a wrong picture of Jesus? Well, I thought about it. One would be we have this idea of Jesus as a personal Savior versus Lord. You know, as a Savior versus Lord, and I tell you, this one is largely the fault of preachers like me and some other well-intentioned Christians, because we go to people and what do we say? You need to be forgiven, you need to be saved, and by saved we mean forgiven, so you can go to heaven. And when someone answers that and says, okay, I believe, I want to be forgiven, I want to go to heaven, and then what happens after they become a Christian? We tell them, okay, now it's time to be a disciple, now you need to start living this way. And they're like, whoa, you didn't mention that up front. And it almost feels like those car salesmen. You ever go and buy a car, and you're like, okay, the price is going to be whatever, $10,000, and you go back to sign it. All right, now the warranty is going to be this, and the interior protection will be this, and the gap protection, and now your price is $13,000. Like, that's not what I agreed on. Like, you're slipping this in at the end. Well, it's almost like that sometimes as we approach people. We tell them about being forgiven and going to heaven, and we forget to lay down my life, take up my cross, and follow Jesus daily. Not to earn his love or earn salvation, but because that's what it means to be a Christian, is to commit my life to Christ. And so people have this wrong picture of Jesus. Well, he's a savior, but this whole Lord thing, that's optional, right? No. And even more when we talk to people, and maybe not so much us, but this idea of Jesus as a personal savior. Well, what's that bring to mind? If you have a personal trainer, what's that mean? 
Well, it's like you get a specific routine gear to you and no one else. You know, if you can afford it, you got a personal chef or a personal this. Like, wow, ain't that great? They do whatever I want. Jesus is my personal savior. I've got to say, I've got a personal savior. Yeah. And it slips into our mind whether we realize it or not. Like, ah, I would say, hey, savior, could you do this now? And that image, we don't realize the distortion. Oh, I know who Jesus is. He's my personal savior. And we know it very well, but it's the wrong image. It's the wrong picture of Jesus. Sometimes we have an inadequate Savior. And by that I mean we undermine grace. Jesus died on the cross, but if I don't do all these good things, I'm not getting in. I'm a Christian, but boy, it's going to take what he did and all these good works. And I've got to add to it. And then you get the two extremes. Anyone that is, has a legalistic mindset has one of two extremes. Either they're prideful because they think they've done it well, or they're shameful because they think they haven't. I've got to do things to add to Jesus' sacrifice. I've done them pretty well, or I'll never be able to do it. I'll never get in. But either way, it's an inadequate image of Jesus. What he did on the cross wasn't sufficient. I've got to add to it. Maybe I think I can. Maybe I think I can't. But I undermine grace. You know, that song we sang, my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross. I don't need to add to anything. Do I need to live a life for God? Absolutely. I commit to that. But that doesn't add to my salvation. But sometimes we have an inadequate view of grace. Sometimes we have a forgiving Savior, but not a transforming Savior. And that has to do with grace, too. I'm saved by grace, and again, we think forgiven. But now that it comes to living for Christ, boy, it's on me. I need to try harder. I need to buckle down. I need to do more. I, I, I. And we don't realize that my transformation, my sanctification, is as much by grace as my forgiveness and my justification. I need God's grace. I need God's power. Do I have a, a choice in the matter? Do I have a part to play? Yes, just like becoming a Christian. I had to heed the call, but it was God's call, and he did what was necessary. Well, same thing. As I grow in my life as a Christian, I need to be, I need to live out that commitment I made to, to walk by him, but that commitment means, God, I, I rely on you. I want you to work in my life to help me grow and transform. And I know it's your power, my decision, your power. But sometimes we don't, we miss that. Our image of Jesus has him as the one who forgives us and is going to be waiting for us at heaven, but the whole time in between, he's just upst upstairs, <laughs> up there, either maybe pointing his finger or shaking his head or something. That's a, the wrong image of Jesus. Well, every week I say there's a, a potential or a root problem that you can sit here and hear all this, but if you don't get this, it's going to be like water in a bucket with a hole in it. And since we're basically in the same passage as the first week, it is that same problem. It, it's pride that says, I know Jesus. I've been a Christian for so long. I've got this. I know Jesus. Boy, this sermon, I'm glad someone else heard it. They needed it, but I've got Jesus. And it takes this humility that says, maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe my image of Jesus is a little wrong. And not just humility, it takes this desire that says, I don't know if I do or not, but man, I don't want to miss out on anything. You know, living this Christian life is tied to knowing Jesus. I don't want to risk missing out on anything. Now, I always talk about, you know, as a preacher, we're supposed to find a felt need. Like, do you have joy right now? You don't. Well, let me show you how to, to get joy. And like, okay, I want to hear that. But the problem with this is I don't realize something is missing. You know, do you have the right image of Jesus? Well, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> There's no felt need. But if you hear this, hopefully it will create a feeling that, okay, maybe there is something missing and I don't want to miss out. And so that desire, you've got more now than you had before. God, please show me who you are in all your fullness. I don't want to miss it. What do I need to do now? What are some practical steps? Again, I can only live out the Christian life to the degree I know Christ, <laughs> but I added a, a second part. I am only living out the Christian life to the degree he truly is preeminent. You sit here and know, here's who he is, he should be preeminent, and walk out the door and nothing's changed. What does it look like to live a life? That's what really got me when I went through this passage. As I was reading through and making notes, uh, what's it look like for Christ to have first place? And you know what, my entire career, my entire life, my ministry of preaching, God has a way of when I'm working on a certain passage and a certain subject, he has a way of showing me, 
relating that to my life. And he did it as I was working on this. And he basically had me learn the lesson, here's what it doesn't look like. The past couple of weeks, I, I don't know, I was talking to Eric a little bit. I love listening to music and my taste in, and, and I can tell good music equipment and, so, and my taste exceed my budget. And so to get even close, I have to do a lot of do-it-yourself. So I found some speakers that I was able to build myself for a third of the price. And so I have been working almost nonstop for like two and a half weeks because I couldn't wait to get these things built and hear them. Well, the problem was the working almost nonstop for two and a half weeks. That was my focus for two and a half weeks. That's what had preeminence for two and a half weeks. That's what was first place. And I begin to really notice it about a weekend, but I'm like, oh, just a little bit more. Now, the problem with anything I do it myself, I am the worst do-it-yourselfer ever. And I know you might shake your head, oh, come on, no. I am the worst do-it-yourself ever. Someday you'll hear the story about me and a music minister drilling for an hour with the drill in reverse. <laughs> yeah. We never did get that whole drill. I broke our arms trying to get the thing done. I am the worst, and so it takes longer. And so, again, this thing, and that's me. I'm like, well, it won't take long. <laughs> and I started to feel it. I started to realize I didn't have the rest that we talked about. Like, we have to trust. We have to rest in God. I didn't do any of that the past two and a half weeks, and boy, it really got to me. And God's like, okay, this is what Christ having preeminence doesn't look like, Steve. <laughs> Use it. Learn from it. Don't do it again, and I keep hoping that'll be the case. Well, what does it look like? You know, it made me think. We're, we're probably familiar with the what would Jesus do saying and bracelets and such. And I think those are good in, in, to some degree, but I think the problem is we can write it off. What would Jesus do? Well, I'm not Jesus. He's perfect. I'm not. Oh, well. And so I think a better bracelet would be W-S-I-D-B-C of J. Do you get that? It's a little longer, but, you know, just write smaller. What should I do because of Jesus? What should I do because of Jesus? Because of who he is and what he's done. Because he is God, because he created the world, because he as God created the church, and that required him to empty himself and come to earth, and then even more to die on a cross. What should I do because of Jesus? What should I do because of Jesus in my time? How I spend my time. If I'm someone who says, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I believe in this Jesus who did all those things. How should that affect my time? How should that affect my job? How should that affect my relationships with other people? My decisions, my spending, my goals, my priorities, my purpose in life. All of those things. They have to be different, don't they? Uh, again, if I believe in God and who Jesus is, that should radically impact my life. Every single part. People should be able to see I'm different. And again, not just because I don't steal and I don't do this. There's some non-Christians who don't do those things. The thing that's really going to set us apart is this walk of faith. I live a life that truly trusts there is a God who's in control and he loves me. And as much as possible, I'm trying to get to the point that impacts every moment of my life. Every moment. I can't but have it impact every moment because we just saw who Christ is and what he's done. You, you can't say, well, yeah, he's, a, he's God, he's the creator, yeah, so what? No, there is no so what when you realize this. It's so everything. Well, what will it look like? When I really begin to put this into practice, and I'm not saying we haven't before, as I begin to put it into practice more, it's going to look like me walking worthy of the Lord. What Paul said, here's what we need to do. And it's attainable. Again, when he said do it, it means we can do it. You can say, I am walking worthy of the Lord. Can I walk more worthy? Sure, but I'm doing it. Paul wouldn't say do it if it was like this impossible, unattainable thing. And it looks like realizing that that's my goal and my purpose and having this abundant life and the fullest possible relationship with God. And I tell you again, I am at the point in life where I don't want to miss that. I don't want to get further on. I don't want to die and look back and God says, that was great, but boy, look what you could have had. And a God wouldn't do, you know, we picture that way. It'd be me realizing, I don't want to miss that. 
And so I would encourage you along with me, make this commitment. We come to our time of invitation. This is an invitation for everyone. God, I invite you, show me even more fully who you are. Show me all of your glory. Show it to me in ways that click with me. Put me in situations where, where I'm able to see it, where I have to make a choice to trust you, and so I can see what happens when I do. God, whatever it takes. That's a scary prayer, isn't it? Whatever it takes, help me to get it. Help me to live this Christian life as you see it, as you intend it. I don't want anything less. And that's a scary prayer. It's a scary invitation. But if that's what you decide right now, God will begin to work that way in you. And if you're at the point that you haven't made that initial decision, again, it starts with that. You can't get the benefits without making that commitment. Yeah, can you live the Christian life? And yeah, it's better. There'd be some good things. If you're you know, kind and honest, there'd be some good things that happen to you. But it ultimately is what we're going to see next week. There's this foundational issue of my relationship with God. It's not restored until I make this commitment and accept him. And that's what it is. It's not just, God, I'll take your forgiveness and the free ticket to heaven. It's the whole deal. God, I commit to laying down my life, picking up my cross daily and walking with you. As part of that, I get forgiveness and I'll spend eternity with you in heaven. But this whole life here, I commit to whatever you have for me, God.